In music education, we often use words such as diversity, inclusion, and access to describe the desire to move away from the whiteness of our field. Diversity is thus framed as a problem. In a study exploring the historical construction of the African American as a subjugated other in the United States, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote famously, Between me and the other world, there is an ever unasked question, how does it feel to be a problem? In music education, we often use the word diversity to describe a lack. So let us pause for a moment and consider how it might feel to be a problem. Some of us know the answer to that question intimately. Me, not so much. I'm white. Nobody questions my presence or looks at me twice in a conservatory, post-secondary school of music, or school music context. I was middle class enough. When poverty hit my family when I was 12, my mother had the musical education herself to step in and continue mine. As a result, when I auditioned for college in a process that Koza describes as an astute listening for whiteness, I was admitted. I had the cultural and social capital to gain a spot. I was well-versed in Western standard, standard? Notation? And had enough opportunities to position me well for a music education degree. I don't know how it feels to be a problem, for my body is not a problem. And that, friends and colleagues, is a problem. Let us consider for a moment how we tend to describe this problem, this lack. The word diversity often signifies not white. As such, it is effectively a euphemism. Recognizing the overwhelming whiteness of the field, however, is indeed a step in the right direction. Further identifying the whiteness as a problem, moreover, signifies some degree of hope. In my own work, I argue for using language as specific as possible. Rather than identifying diversity or lack of diversity as a problem, let's call it what it is. The overwhelming whiteness is, in fact, the problem. Inclusivity is another interesting word. To include, there must always be an outside, the excluded. I consider inclusivity and tolerance as two sides of the same coin. To tolerate means to allow the existence, occurrence, or practice of something one does not necessarily like or agree with without interference. Tolerance is not a quality to which we should aspire. So as we talk about inclusivity, we might ask ourselves whether we, we, mean to include in a manner that is meaningful or merely intend to tolerate. We also talk a lot in music education about access. I like access. I believe that resources, programs, and locations in society should be available to all. I think for music education, the question actually becomes precisely what are we advocating for access to? When we, as music educators, say that all students should have access to music education, which music education do we mean? Do we mean the band orchestra choir paradigm? Do we mean theory and training? And I use that word deliberately in Western Standard Notation. Why would we assume that music education in its current incarnation is something to which everyone should want access? Different kinds of music programs pro proliferate across the United States. These programs are not always in schools. Songwriting programs, hip-hop community programs, beat-making workshops, DJing 101. As we describe the problem, the overwhelming whiteness of music education, I argue that the words we use often get in our way of actually addressing the problem. Using the words diversity, inclusion, and access often lead us to ask a question about how we might include more people in the core of what already exists. Rather than asking what it is about music education, our practices, programs, and pedagogy that might reinscribe its whiteness, we often refuse to look to the core of what we are, of who we are. In Queer Phenomenology, Sarah Ahmed writes, The repetition of work, effort, and practice is what makes the work disappear or appear effortless. The repetition of acts, she argues, is crucial as what we do do affects what we can do. So what do we do in music education, and how does it affect what we can do? What practices do we value? Whose music impresses us? What skills must a high school senior successfully demonstrate to gain admission to a music education program? We know the answers to these questions. And yes, of course, there are exceptions. And the exceptions, as Ed Zarath, David Myers, and Pat Campbell note at the post-secondary level, will show us the way. So what practices are we talking about? The ensemble paradigm, band, orchestra, choir, staunchly remains at the center of music education. We celebrate these ensembles through festivals. Western standard notation remains important, very important. 
and the notion of sound before symbol reminds us that we are, in fact, supposed to arrive at the symbol. Sound as sound, for sound, is simply not enough. In music education, we also spend a great deal of time replicating the music of others rather than creating original work. Even popular music education paradigms often rely intensively on covering existing music. We prioritize Western classical instruments. In popular music, we value the guitar, bass, and drum kit. We don't have to look far to recognize whose raced and classed identities align with these practices. Whose music impresses us? How many of us have taught or seen a classroom adorned with posters of Bach, Beethoven, and the boys? A collection of images memorializing the work of white men from the past. How many of us, upon recognizing that standard, standard? Music room decorations include these posters, have spent significant time scouring the internet in various poster stores looking for alternatives that better fit their communities? I have too. It takes a lot of work to choose to value different voices. We have what Maud Hickey calls a weem default in music education, Western European art music. Art? Music? We also know which skills a high school senior must successfully demonstrate to gain admission to a music education program. Auditions, startlingly, are effectively identical now to when I auditioned for university 20 years ago, to when my mom auditioned in the 1960s. Julia Coza points to the whiteness of auditions. Indeed, what is the likelihood of gaining access to a college music education program with only high school music experience? No. It is those students with private lessons, enough money for instruments, who graduate from programs that often resemble what takes place at the post-secondary level who gain admission. I taught in what would be described in the U.S. as an inner-city school. The school wanted to be able to say they offered instrumental music. What about being able to say that was so important, I wonder? When I began teaching, I soon discovered that the instruments at the school were my age. Indeed, they were purchased the year I was born. At the school I taught, there was also a gifted program. Gifted? The district bused these students in from neighboring communities. Many of the so-called gifted students rented instruments. For them, the cost was not prohibitive. Everyone else used the school instruments. Which students, I wonder, would be well-positioned for a university audition or even for a high school music program? If, as Ahmed argues, what we do do shapes what we can do, how did these practices stop us from moving forward? Ahmed goes further. She says, We could even describe whiteness as a bad habit, a series of actions that are repeated, forgotten, that allow some bodies to take up space by restricting the mobility of others. We have a habit of whiteness in music education. And as Deb Bradley notes, we need to break that bad habit. When we frame issues of diversity, inclusion, and access as simply inviting more people to participate in practices that are distinctly white, we delimit what is possible. In our field, we have been having these conversations since at least the 1960s, and yet we have somehow failed to address the core of what music education is. Rather than changing the core or beginning again, we stubbornly stick with what we've got, what we do do, and try to add practices and people to what already exists. We know that this additive approach doesn't work because it hasn't worked. We need a, we need a new plan. Ahmed further argues that we inherit the reachability of some objects. Race becomes a question of what is within reach, what is available to perceive and do things with. Not only is music education not within reach for many populations, reaching it within its current incarnation is not even desirable. If your race, your culture, your class, your sexuality, your very identity is negated by a subject in school, why would you want to reach? To participate. Perhaps, instead of looking around the various rooms of music education and identifying diversity as a problem, we might look around these same rooms and consider their whiteness and wonder at the problem of whiteness. We might further recognize that those groups who know intimately what it feels like to be a problem have had enough. I am a white woman, and the fact that I fit perfectly in the demographic of our field is a problem. To return to the question of access, we need to reconsider what we should advocate for access to. If the reachability or participation in music education is not even desirable, we indeed have a problem. And it's time we actually tried throwing it out and starting again. We've tried everything else. If the issue is whiteness, when we start again, we can perhaps begin with identity more purposefully. Perhaps following Lyndon McCoy's excellent volume on culturally responsive teaching. Which students are in the music classroom? 
what practices resonate with them, what would it take on the part of music educators to center those practices, which musics do students value, perhaps they can share what excites them about these musics, there are plenty of pro programs leading the way. I'm calling on music educators who are white, white like me, to actively look for whiteness, to make that a habit, to look around every room and notice who is there, and notice who is not, and when, not if, we find ourselves in a music education space that is predominantly white, let's call it what it is, a problem, and let us resolve to do something about it. Only then can we move forward. Thank you.